from downtown Milwaukee, welcome to Money Talk with Bob Landis. Each week, professional advisors from Landis and Company Investments discuss the latest financial developments, offering timely insight and long-term perspective. This is Money Talk for the 9th of June, 2023. Checking the calendar, we're into festival season. Last week, Pride Fest. This week, it's Polish Fest. The Brewers are home this weekend with the Oakland A's. And back on this day in 1975, we were introduced to the Betamax videotaping system. And we all instantly thought we were Steven Spielberg. And finally, it's National Strawberry Rhubarb Pie Day. That's my favorite pie, except for all the rest. We're starting off with a story that just screams Milwaukee, except it's set in Minnesota. An inventor unveiled his latest creation, a beer-powered Harley-Davidson. Let me repeat that. A beer-powered Harley-Davidson. Who knew we needed that? There's a guy in Atlanta who's a tattoo artist by day, but at night he turns into Robin Hood. If you park illegally in downtown, you get the boot. You know the contraption that they slap onto your tire and hold your car hostage? Well, our Robin Hood learned you can find boot keys online for 50 bucks. So now for fun, he cruises around at night, setting cars free like a member of PETA liberating puppies. (laughs) And finally, from New Zealand, Hell Pizza, yep, that's the name, Hell Pizza, launched a new payment plan. Order now, pay when you're dead. They call it the afterlife payment. Only a select few will qualify. Customers will be invited to sign a real amendment to their will, allowing the the cost of the pizza to be collected upon their death. And the agreement is legally binding. And this is literally pizza to die for. (laughs) On the podcast today, we have Steve Giles, Tom Papenfuss, Joel Driesang, and wrapping up the week, here's Kyle Tedding. Well, thanks, Max. Another pretty good week for stocks. The NASDAQ up a tenth of a percent, closing at the bell at 13,259. The S&P up four-tenths of a percent, closing at 4299 just missed that 4300 And the Dow Jones Industrial Average closed the week at 33877 up three-tenths of a percent for the week. For the year, the NASDAQ up a pretty stellar 27.2, the S&P up 12.8, and the Dow Jones Industrial Average up 3.2%. You know, Steve, it feels like we're in a point in time for investors in which markets just kind of are set adrift. There's not a ton of economic data this week. We're past earnings season. It seems like all the traders have gone to the beach. And so, you know, as you look, a market that doesn't have a lot of motivating factors now can get pushed a lot of directions. The good news this week, we're up a little bit. We got economic data that we can talk about a little later that's mostly supportive of the story we've been telling for a very long time. But it feels like, you know, week to week, things can shift pretty quick here as we start to look at a Fed meeting, as we start to look at any kinds of uh, numbers of other things that are on tap. Uh, you know, how do you how do you talk to clients about getting through a summer in which we've already had such a great start to the year? Well, you know, I think it's important to remember that times like this come around every once in a while. Uh, and as we all know, we're back in the middle of a bull market. Uh, S&P now is officially over that 20 percent from its most previous uh, uh, low back in October. But these are the times where, as investors, you really have to – Uh, Be patient and trust the allocation and remember that sometimes the market ebbs and flows. And if we all realize that historically the markets will do somewhere 8, 9, 10% annualized and we're already up 12.8 on the S&P 500 this year, Kyle, that kind of tells me that, hey, this market can go sideways and that shouldn't really surprise us. I think I'd be okay with that, right? That when we look at our portfolios, our bond funds up 1, 1 1.5, 2%, depending on where you're looking, how far out. Um, remember, that's only half a year's worth of interest payments from those bonds. Um, it's not fair to say that we'll get the other half and nothing else for the rest of the year. But if that's all we got, you're talking about a year in which bonds probably get 4%. If stocks trade sideways from here, you're talking about a year in which kind of broad measures of stocks are up 10 to 12 that, that's a pretty decent year. I'd be satisfied with that, Kyle. Yeah, and if we can get it all in six months – yeah, the rest of the year matters, and we're going to care that things are down a little or up a little bit. We have to, but 
also, you know, I'm, I'm pretty happy with where we are so far. Yeah, unfortunately, human beings are emotional. And as investors, we always are victims of our most recent perceptions. So we look at the first six months of the year and we extrapolate that out into the back half of this year. And we just expect that the markets will continue to go up another 10 to 12 percent. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next week. We don't know what's going to happen next month. Uh, and there's always going to be something that the market is going to be um, looking at uh, as it relates to its performance. And we just don't know what that is going to be yet. You know, Steve, you mentioned the bull market and, and maybe a time to get Tom in on this here. Um, it's such a, a weird thing to stay still 10 percent below the you know January 3rd, 2022 peak that now all of a sudden the market's in another bull market, the bear market, fairly average from a length perspective. Um, but from a, a return perspective, it wasn't all that significant. And now that we're back in the bull market, a reminder that those bull markets tend to run for a while. The shortest we've ever seen is 13 months. And so, um, you know, not to say that things can't get better or worse from here, but, you know, a lot to be encouraged about now that we've gotten back into uh, the happier side of that bull and bear debate. Yeah, I think, um, you know, looking at the the nature and the kind of I th- what I spent a lot of time here in the past few weeks is just looking at kind of the structure of this bear, uh, bull market and, and how we've kind of gotten to this point. Uh, I think it's important to appreciate where we've come and how far, you know, how far we've come to this point. Um, but I, we still can't abandon our principles. I mean, I think when you kind of dig deeper into this bull market and look at the constructs of it, meaning what is where is it comprised of? You know, it's it's really being led by just a few or a handful of very strong names, um, and, and so a lot of clients are looking at the portfolios, looking at performance, and probably noticing that well, the S and P's up twelve point eight, but they're probably not quite up that much. Um, just a nature and a practice of diversification and spreading out risk. And, and truthfully, if you're not exposed to those six, seven, eight names, where the predominant uh, percentage of performance has come from. You're definitely going to be a bit behind. I think if you, I think the numbers are that if you strip out the perhaps the six names or so from the six biggest names in the S and P, you've eliminated almost about 95% of the this year's returns. So if you're not heavily weighted or concentrated in those names, and naturally as we practice risk management here, as everyone and uh, every diligent investor should be, um, you're seeing a little bit something that might be not quite as pleasing. But I, I think let's not look at what has happened, but look at what possibly can happen. And I think if you're a diligent investor or perhaps even a trader and you've you know, reaped the benefit of all these gains to where we've gotten, uh, gotten to this point year to date, you're probably looking to g- capture some of those gains and put them in your back pocket at some point. So I, I think it's not about looking at what has happened, but where things may go. And I think where clients are right now positioned, I think they're in a really good spot for where things may be heading. And you know why clients are in a good spot? It's because of their diversification, assuming they stayed diversified. Uh, this this narrow uh, trending of the market up to just a few select stocks, I think, uh, is a great reminder of making sure that you have balance and diversification in your portfolio. For those investors that looked at last year's returns, Tom, and saw nothing but negative in growth and said, that's it, I'm done with growth, I'm selling growth, I don't want to have anything to do with growth anymore, just missed out on uh, uh, the the biggest uh, index returns for the first half of this year, the NASDAQ has far outpaced the S&P, the NASDAQ has far outpaced the Dow, uh, and And again, this is just another reminder, don't go running into the growth of your sector just because the last six months have been fantastic. Hold on to your value, hold on to your blend, hold on to your growth, hold on to your diversification, and don't give up on any one asset class just because of recent performance. So Steve, is that that to say that those who look at their portfolios and their portfolios might not be doing as well as those six or seven or eight stocks, that they shouldn't be disappointed so much now that they should be thinking about the longer term. Well, and even I, I would sorry, I would just add, you know, to look at their their funds and their their value and their growth funds, and not just year to date, but then also add in last year. Those value funds are, I think, are probably still ahead of where those growth funds are because of how far down they are. So really, if you just look beyond the last five months and include the next, you know, twelve months beyond that, seventeen months, you're really not in a bad position. I think you're a little bit more optimistic than you you might be just looking at year-to-date numbers. Well, and let's talk about the why. So the growth stocks so far this year, in particular, the seven or eight names that have really driven a lot of the run, um, 
have rallied for a couple of very specific reasons. Number one, this artificial intelligence revolution. The names that are on that list of uh, the leaders have been pretty active players for the most part in uh, the artificial intelligence space. You add in, though, that those growth names in general tend, by their very name, to be expecting higher rates of earnings growth going forward. And if interest rates now are more stable than what we've seen in a very long time, we don't have to discount that future growth as much as we were thinking we might have to. And so it allows the price to come up again. It allows higher price to earnings ratios than maybe what we were thinking was going to be reasonable coming into this year. And so I think that, to me, is a big reason why I understand the rally. It isn't the tech bubble. It isn't uh, you know a company that doesn't have any earnings that ultimately is being bid up far beyond what it should be. These are businesses that have real potential not just in the future, but which are already gener- generating cash flow today. They're quality businesses. And so um, I- I'm not suggesting, you know, Steve, as you do, one or the other. Um, but as you say, you know, diversification is key here. Yeah, absolutely. But it, knowing that the market is a forward uh, indicator and is always looking out six, nine, 12 months from now, uh, there are some suggestions that the Fed could perhaps be lowering rates as early as the first quarter of next year. Uh, We know that those more growthier oriented companies in the tech sector, uh, which are a bit more rate sensitive to changes by the Fed, uh, will benefit from rates going down. So in addition to the Fed being near a top as far as raising rates, the prospect of rates going down is creating some tailwinds for for those very companies. Absolutely it is. You add in the conversation about valuations and growth stocks looking a little expensive, but that looks less so with those tailwinds from from rates. But value stocks, because they haven't participated to the same extent now, starting to look a little attractive again. And so, um, you know, I think it's never one or the other. We, you know, you rightfully point out uh, there are reasons why you want both. And right now is the perfect example. I want the opportunity that lies ahead for those growth names, but I'd like to get some discounts as well, and that's what we're seeing some in in the value side of the market. I think also, just to kind of add to that, uh, in the last week, we've what we're just recently highlighted is the lack of breadth in this market, not enough names participating. I I think um, just in the last week or so, we went from about 30% of the S&P 500 names uh, we're below their 50-day moving average, and now it's up to 50% just in the last week. We've also seen a rally in the Russell 2000, the S&P uh, mid-cap 400. Um, so we're starting to see, in addition to more companies just in the last week alone, start to participate, which is, again, a, a positive sign. What I tell clients is usually a, a more a better indicator that this bull market has better legs to it. Joel, a bit of economic data this week, not uh, maybe the deluge we've seen in prior weeks, but uh, with the conversation about recession to continue continuing to hang in the air, important to look at at least the data points we can get. We got news, for example, on the ISM services sector index, um, and more of the same conversation. Right, Kyle, and and that more of the same is basically that we're continuing to grow, um, but that the growth is slowing, um, and and you know to to the latter point, the the slowing. That's what the Fed has been trying to do by raising interest rates for 10 meetings in a row. Um, and it sounds like n- the expectation is that when they meet next week that, you know, that'll, they'll, they'll break that spell. Um, but th- the other part of that, the, 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 this, the growth is we're still growing. So, um, so that's c- sort of putting at bay. I saw that, that there are fewer economists predicting a recession this year. Um, you know, we know that inevitably, the way things go, that inevitably we're going to have a recession, but there are fewer uh, expectations for that this year. So, um, yeah, slower growth, but growth. Slow growth is still growth, absolutely. Yeah, and, and the the other uh, indicator that we had this week that that emphasizes that is the um, the revolving credit uh, outstanding that the Fed reports, and that's basically looking at credit card death. Death, sorry, well, sometimes credit card death is something that happens. But um, it's it's the debt that people take on, you know, as part of their um, optimism that they can keep spending and, and, and pay it off. And, and that's a real indication that um, consumers are still wanting to, to spend money. And we know that that's what really propels our economy. 
but they're doing it at a slower rate. So again, growth, but slower. Yeah, more conscious of perhaps what they're buying and what they're choosing to put on credit. We got some data on factory orders, growth there as well, but slow growth. Well, yeah, and the, the caveat with that is that the, the, a lot of the growth, uh, most of the growth uh, in, in the latest month was from uh, defense orders. So you take that out and actually it sank a little. But if you, if you look, there's an indicator in there called the core capital goods orders, and that is kind of a proxy for business investment, and that's been pretty steady. You know, I think all of this points to the very same statement we've made now for months, which is the Federal Reserve is having its way in slowing economic growth. We're reasonably confident that, at least for now, uh, they've done a good job of navigating the downside of that that slower growth, which is ultimately a recession. Um, we'll continue to keep an eye on that data, as I know they're keeping a close eye. But if next week we do get the pause that so many are predicting, if it means that maybe in July or at the next meeting we get a quarter point increase again just to kind of test the waters to see what's happening, well, now we're in the phase of, uh, of monetary policy where we get a little more understanding of what, what the long-term implications of this are because now we're starting to feel out what's the end game. And, you know, maybe it's that by later this year or early next year we're cutting rates, or maybe it's that we can keep rates higher because the economy is strong enough to support it. Regardless of where we end on that conversation, you know, I think it's important to remember that, you know, the the balanced portfolio, Steve, that you talked about earlier, the opportunities, Tom, that we were talking about in some of those growth names and some of the other things that are out there, all of those play a part in either side of that conversation, raise or, or pause or cut. Uh, whether it's a little bit slower than we think now or whether it's the economy just keeps humming along, um, you know, it's that balance that helps us navigate. With that, we enjoy doing the program for you. We'll talk to you again next week. Thank you for listening to Money Talk with Bob Landis. If you have a financial question you want answered on next week's show, email it to moneytalk at landis.com. To keep informed throughout the week, visit our Money Talk page at landis.com.